Hey, all right. Hey, Coach Chad Parks here. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our webinar tonight. Thank you so much. So try to give a few minutes for everybody to get logged on. Uh, we know we have a number of people registered. So like I said, we just wait a little bit of time, let everybody get logged on, and then we get it rolling. Uh, tonight, you know, this is a joint venture between Wrestling Mindset and, uh, and our man, Coach Myers, who runs Old School Gym, co-owner of Old School Gym. And so we'll go through some of this information on mindset training. We'll go through information on, uh, you know, mindset as it applies to wrestling or as it applies to various sports and other areas of life. So we're going to give it about one more minute or so, and then we will get this thing rolling. And real quick, at any point, if you have any questions, there is a chat box. Please go ahead and write any questions in the chat box, uh, whether it be for mindset, strength, conditioning, whatever, and then we will do our best to answer those. All right, so we have a lot of people in here now. I can see the uh, the attendees. Uh, Coach Myers will be on in just a second. So, like a lot of us, uh, he works, you know, does multiple things. And uh, man, I actually just got to interview Coach Myers on my podcast, and that guy is a wealth of inspiration, uh, a wealth of knowledge when it comes to strength conditioning and training. And we've done a few of these webinars together, and he absolutely brings it every time. So. A little bit about me real quick. Uh, coach Chad Parks, I'm a wrestling coach in the state of Kansas, college All-American wrestler, and I've been with Winning Mindset and Wrestling Mindset for a number of years. I have athletes around the nation that I train and work with, as well as teams. Uh, a lot of individuals you know, in the sports of wrestling, MMA, jiu-jitsu, have backgrounds in those areas. And so uh, mindset's a great passion of mine, as well as strength conditioning. So for me, it's awesome to be on here with Coach Myers and to get to uh, – run through with him. So there's a little bit of information about Coach Myers, and I'll let him speak more on that whenever he gets, um, whenever he's able to get logged in. So I see he's doing so right now. Again, if you have any questions anytime during this webinar, please, uh, you know, anything you want to do with your individual athletes, anything you want to do with your teams concerning mindset, strength, conditioning. And then at the end, we'll open up sort of a chat session, but you can always put those down in the box and we will try to answer those um, the best we can. A little bit of my information on here.
All right. Hey, sorry to make you guys wait. So it looks like uh, Coach Myers on his phone and his laptop. Uh, and again, we've done these webinars together a few times. It keeps crashing. So uh, I can see right now he's logged in, but he said that it won't allow him to use his camera, won't allow him to use his uh, microphone right now. So I'm going to go ahead and get started on the wrestling mindset portion. And then as soon as Coach Myers can get everything you know working, then he'll jump in and we'll go into his strength conditioning and all the knowledge he's going to bring us tonight. So again, sorry for delay. Uh, we respect your time. All right. Mindset red flags. You know, we like to go over first off, what is mindset training? Why do we do mindset training? And a lot of times when people think about mindset training, you know, immediately what comes to their mind is mental toughness. And that's a big part of it, right? Uh, we want to be mentally tough. That is, you know, something that we highly value, something we need in sports, something that we need in life. But mindset training is more than that. We have 13 mental muscles that we go through and train our athletes and our teams on, you know, when it comes to mindset. And it's something that we highly believe needs to be structured, needs to be trained on uh, pretty much every single day. All right. So I have a few different slides here that I'm going to go through with you guys and I'll discuss these. So first off, and again, this applies to wrestling, but this applies to um, every sport that you can think of. You know, whenever we train our athletes, we train them specifically for their sport. So we have football mindset, soccer mindset, lacrosse, wrestling, MMA, jujitsu, about every sport you can think of. And we have people that are high level in those areas as coaches that work one-on-one -on -one with athletes, work with clubs, teams, organizations, uh, even with business, right? So I'm going to go through real quick though with wrestling, these mindset red flags. And these mean that we know that the athlete, and maybe you are the athlete, maybe you're the coach, maybe you're a parent that's on here. We know that the athlete has the physical tools, has the ability to go out and perform and do these things. But the athlete isn't able to do them because of a mindset, right? And I often ask my, I often ask teams I'm working with or when I'm presenting at conferences and things like that, how much of your sport do you think is mental? And almost every time, hands raise and people say 90%, 95%. Every now and then we get an answer that's a little bit lower, but for the most part, it's 90% or greater. All right. So here's one of the things about that, though, that we call the training paradox. Even though most of us agree that our sport is 90 percent mental, we typically train 90 percent physical or more. And I'll admit, and I'm a lifelong athlete. My dad's a Hall of Fame wrestling coach. I've been around some great coaches. Um, when I went early in my coaching career, man, I sprinkled in some mindset stuff. And I naturally probably did some of it, but I, I wasn't super intentional with my athletes about always doing mindset training and having a plan and having a system in place so that we could address things like these mindset red flags that we're about to go over in a minute. So if you are a coach or an athlete, physical training is important. We want you getting in great shape. We want you running and lifting and working out, perfecting your techniques and doing all the things that you need to be do, you know, that you need to do um, to elevate yourself and to get better and better on a daily basis. You got to do those things. But if you have all the physical tools in the world and you don't have the mental capacity, if you don't have the mental tools, to back it up, then you are really limiting yourself. The best athletes in the world, they have mindset coaches. They do mindset training, you know, and for us with uh, wrestling mindset, I mean, we work with youth all the way through Olympic level guys. And then we have a lot of professional athletes in MMA and other sports as well. So some of the red flags, number one here, doesn't pull the trigger or no killer instinct. And you've seen them and maybe you've experienced it. In practice, you're, you're a killer, right? But then you get out in a match and you're scared to pull the trigger. And a lot of times it's because you don't want to mess up. You don't want to lose. You don't want to get scored on. You don't want to give up points. And that's mental. That's a mindset. So for us, immediately, that's a red flag. We have ways and methods to address that. Maybe you're giving good opponents too much respect. And we always want to respect everybody that we compete against. And, you know, I always say for wrestling, like, heck, man, everybody, we're working hard, right? It's just a physical and difficult sport. But – we don't give them too much respect in the sense that, oh, man, this guy's got a big name. He's probably going to beat me. And some people do that as soon as they see the name or see the team they're from. They give too much respect instead of just going out and making the other person earn it. Sometimes your athlete may wrestle too cautious or hesitant. They're afraid to lose or make mistakes. Okay, They're a practice room wrestler. Again, we've seen those. They're practice room champions. And then they don't really step out there and live up to their ability when the lights are on. Um, or chokes in big matches. 
you know, maybe they do phenomenal in, in a local tournament or a dual meet and they have the ability to be one of the best in the state or nation. But when they get in those big matches, they choke. Again, these are red flags and things that we need to address mentally. So why do we do mindset training? How is this done? And, you know, we're going to be on with a strength conditioning specialist in a minute and Coach Myers. But we consider mindset strength training for the mind. And strength training is a passion of mine as well. Uh, it's something I have a big background in and I and I love. So hey, there's Coach Myers. I see him coming on. So we consider mindset training strength training for the mind. The same way that we do strength training year round. All right. The same way that we kind of have what we call periodization. And maybe you'll think about it this way. You have off-season training, you have preseason training, you have in-season training when it comes to strength conditioning. And you're hopefully doing that to optimize your athlete's performance, right? Times that we're going to be gaining strength, times that we're a little more in maintenance, um, or maybe picking up the cardio and the muscular endurance, things like that. Well, we can and should be doing the exact same thing when it comes to strength training for the mind. All right. So it should be year round. And sometimes people think, oh, this is something I want to do in season. It's great in season. I do this with my athletes in season. I have a lot of athletes around the nation I work with in season. But the same way when we do strength training out of season, we build, we build, we build. And then when we walk into the season, we're more prepared, right? I mean, let's be honest, in every sport, you can never be too fast. You can never be too strong. You can never be too technical. Okay. So the same thing, we can never have our mind too strong. We have our minds are malleable. And so we need to have this growth mindset and everything that we do influences or affects our minds positively, negatively, makes it stronger, makes it weaker. So we want to do systematic strength training year round. Okay. And it's active training. So whenever we're working with teams or working with athletes, they have a curriculum that we send to them. And so if I'm doing one-on-ones with an athlete, I typically work with them every week. We get on and we FaceTime, uh, we Zoom, however we decide to set it up. And then we go through the curriculum. We apply it to their situation. We apply it to their sport. It's active. There are things that they have to do on a daily basis. There are things we have them doing on a weekly basis to constantly develop the mind and to make it stronger so that then they can utilize the physical tools that they have whenever we need them. All right. So it is active training with exercises, challenges, activities. We have a daily mindset plan. We have principles and we have these hanging all over our wrestling room. I have the athletes I work with hang them on their bathroom mirror. And in the morning, they're going to say their mindset principles. I like to have it stacked. Uh, hopefully, everybody has a habit of brushing their teeth in the morning and again at night. So we like to say our mindset principles before we brush our teeth in the morning. And then we do it again at night, just putting those things into our brain. And then we provide you know, motivation. And hey, what's awesome about winning mindset and wrestling mindset? We have a lot of free tools out there. And honestly, I told you early in my coaching career, whenever I was sprinkling in some mindset training, it wasn't super intentional and focused on it. I would go to Wrestling Mindset and I would take a lot of their free stuff, print it off from the blogs or write down notes and bring it in and talk to my guys about it. OK, and then I discovered the full program and the power of that and how much better it was. So let me go through real quick a couple of just simple um, modified but simple lessons that we like to teach what I would call foundational lessons for us. All right. One here is this is what we call predator versus prey mindset. OK, and we can see from the picture. Eyes in front like to hunt, eyes on the side like to hide. So think about a predator animal and, you know, lions, tigers, and bears. I live in Kansas, right? Lions, tigers, bears, oh my. So these are predator animals. Their eyes are in the front. They're at the top of the food chain in their area. So when they wake up in the morning, their objective is to go out and hunt and get food for their family and survival, but not in the means like a prey animal who wakes up and their eyes are on the side and they're looking all around. They're worried about getting eaten. They're worried about everything else around them. They're nervous. Um, worry about things they can't control. All right. Whereas, you know, the predator animal is controlling the controllables. And I love this picture down here. And, you know, you're like, hey, why do we have a swimming picture on a wrestling mindset? Michael Phelps, one of the greatest U.S. athletes of all time. We see him down here and his eyes are forward, right? He's, he's focused on his objective. He's going after his goal. He's performing his techniques. His opponent, however, has lost focus. He has slipped into a prey mindset. Phelps over here, he's in a predator mindset. He's going after it. His opponent is now in a prey mindset. He's looking to the side. He's looking at Michael Phelps. Now his, you know, his own swimming stroke is going to be off. His breathing is going to be off. He's lost sight of his objective. 
And so whenever we talk about predator versus prey, tell our athletes, hey, go look at yourself in the mirror, right? Our eyes are in the front. We like to hunt. What is your objective? What are your goals? What are your desired outcomes? And what are the exact steps and systems we need to do to get there? Let's lay it out. And at that point, you know, we can go through goal setting with them and we can create a system and a daily plan of action to be able to get to that. Controlling the controllables and forgetting about the rest so that we're not burning mental energy, we're not burning emotional energy on things that we really can't control. All right. We don't want to have a fan mentality. That's a prey mindset. And the fan mentality is looking at the rankings all the time. Hey, I tell you what, man, I was ranked in the next before. It's pretty cool to see your name on there. Guess what? It doesn't matter. When you step out on the mat, you still got to prove it every single time. A lot of times, hey, fans, right? Mom, daddy, and the fans look at the look at the rankings. That's cool. But when we talk to the athletes, we don't need to bring those up. Athletes, you don't need to look at those. Your job is to focus on what you can't control, which is your effort, your attitude, the way you practice, the lifestyle you live, the food you're eating, the way you sleep, the way you train, all those things. So we don't want to slip into a fan mentality, which also includes things like looking at, oh man, I know this guy's last name. He was a state champion last year. Or the team he wrestles for, they, you know, they're traditionally good. This kid must be really good. It doesn't matter, right? Those are prey mindsets. We want to have a predator mindset, focus on what we can't control, and then go after it. Sometimes we're worried about what other people think about us. Again, that's none of our, really, it's none of our business. And the people that matter, mom, dad, coaches, teammates, peers, they're going to love us regardless, win or lose. But there are a lot of times maybe we're afraid coach is going to be mad and get on to us. Maybe we're afraid of the car ride home and mom and dad are going to get on to us or critique everything we're doing. So as athletes, that can be really scary. Ultimately, the athlete has to realize I can't control what other people say or what they think or what they do. This is my journey. I got to put everything into it. So we give the athletes tools to be able to deal with those situations and to be able to focus on what really matters. OK, and then we're also looking at extras, extra things. Um, can be good. Hobbies can be good. It can take your mind off of uh, always being so serious and always thinking about your sport, right? And the hobbies can be good. Extras can be good, but they could also be bad. And, you know, a simple example I like to think of is this video games. I'm not a gamer myself, but, you know, a lot of my athletes, hey, they like video games. That's okay. That's fine. Maybe it's, a, you know, if you're taking care of business, right? You get home, you've done your schoolwork, you know, you've eaten, you've taken care of business, chores at the house. Have a little time on the video games or have a little time on social media. But if it's holding you or keeping you up till 2.30 in the morning, now that extra, which could be okay, which could be decent, could be a little bit of relief, all right, that could be a real struggle for you if you have that extra going on. Because if you sit till 2.30 in the morning doing this, now all of a sudden that same person doesn't get the rest. They don't recover. They don't have energy for the next day. That affects the way they practice. That affects the way that they're in school. So they're not getting better all the time. All right. So we want to talk to our athletes and evaluate everything, including the extras they have in their life and get rid of anything that's not leading us toward our objectives. So we keep the predator mindset in the classroom. We have a predator mindset. We're studying. We're preparing for our tests. We're doing all of our homework. We are doing all of those things that matter versus a prey mindset. It's taking a test and being scared. I'm going to fail. And especially if you know that you didn't go in and do the work ahead of time, then there's a real fear. But there's a confidence that comes with doing the work ahead of time and knowing, hey, I did everything I could. Now I'm going to walk in here and I'm going to ace this test. OK, so we give people the ability to be able to do that. All right. So I'm going to get ready. Here's our mindset principles real quick. And then I'm going to turn this over to Coach Myers. Hey, we have our athletes do this every single day. All right. I'm thankful for the opportunity to wrestle. I'm aggressive and relentless. I have no fear of losing or making mistakes. and I never give up. We're saying that, we're believing it every single day. And if you have any questions about anything with mindset, you can ask me at the end as I get ready to turn this over to Coach Myers. We want your athletes to succeed. If you are an athlete, we want you to succeed, and we're here to help you. Coach Myers, my man, uh, so good to see you. Thanks for being on here, and we can't wait to hear your knowledge and your wisdom. So I'm going to turn it over to Coach Myers. All right, thanks, Coach. I appreciate you, man. Sorry I had a little bit of technical difficulties trying to get on earlier. You know, so as much time as I spend on my phone, on social media and all that stuff, I'm still kind of uh, an old guy from the 90s that has a tough time with this stuff sometimes. So anyway, I appreciate all you guys tuning in. I know it's late. You guys are taking time away from your, your families and everything else to kind of listen to, you know, uh, Coach Parks and myself talk. So I want to talk about something a little bit different today. You know, these last few times I talked about some very you know specific things, you know, how to prevent injury or, you know, how to 
change your exercise selection based on the time of year. But what I want to talk about today is give you guys some great tips on how to maximize the efficiency of your workouts when you're dealing with group training settings. So what I mean by that is when you have, you know, an entire high school team or your college team or your club team or whatever it is, you might have 20, 30, 40 athletes, and you might have some great ideas, some great exercises. All right, we're going to lift heavy, we're going to condition, we're going to do all these great things. But if you don't put a lot of thought into how to set this workout up to run efficiently, it is not going to go well because the more kids you have, the more athletes you have, I don't care if it's the most elite level or the beginner, then there's going to be too much downtime, there's talking, there's distractions, and then you end up as a coach kind of running around and getting a lot of nothing done, all right? So I'm going to go over kind of some strategies to make sure that you guys are taking these workouts that you're planning and you're, you know, getting a strategy in place for maximum efficiency. You know, you only have your athletes for so much time, so you got to make sure that time counts. So there's kind of two categories I'm going to go over. One are going to be kind of general considerations, and the other one is going to be kind of more specific, how you're going to set the workouts up, okay? So we're going to start very general first, and then I'll get into actually telling you how to set them up, not just with your personnel, but also with your exercise selection, okay? So when you're thinking about um, exercise efficiency or your workout efficiency, kind of the general um, things that you want to think of is first, what is the goal of the training session? All right, now I know we always, we want to get in shape, we want to get stronger, and there's always going to be overlap. You know, we're, we're trying to get faster, we're trying to get stronger, we're trying to increase our work capacity, all these different things, but you can do all those things in one workout, but you need to think, all right, what is the number one goal of this workout, all right? And if the number one goal is, hey, I, we, we got to use this as a strength workout today, then you need to think about also the time of day, because if you're doing what a lot of coaches do, maybe they're throwing their lift in after wrestling practice, the body's already fatigued, your guys are dehydrated, their muscles are tired, you're not going to be able to do a workout primarily geared towards gaining strength when they're already in a fatigue state. So if that's the only time that week where you have to get a lift in or whatever, it might have to be more of a conditioning style. Like now we're working on work capacity or we're doing general conditioning. So you have to think, what is the goal of that workout? And if the goal is, hey, we want to do speed training, then they need to do it when they're fresh. Maybe you need to flip-flop and you need to do that speed training before they get their wrestling in. You know, maybe you need to get that heavy lift in before the wrestling, whether that's early in the day or whether it is, you know, right before practice. So that's always a good thing to kind of start with and say, all right, what is our primary goal for this training session? And that kind of goes hand-in-hand hand with the next one I've already touched on a little bit is the time of day. The time of day in relation to what else the athletes have going on, whether it's school or whether it's their actual, you know, on the mat wrestling training, the time of day is really going to affect what you're going to be able to get out of the workout and how you're going to program it. You know, if it's early in the day before school, then you might be able to get in some speed work and some strength training and do some conditioning at the end. And they're going to be able to be finding it the most out of all of that, but you're not going to, be able to do all of those things if the time of day is after practice. They're already too fatigued at that point, conditioning, and maybe some prehab might be your best bet. All right. The next thing you want to think about is kind of your modality utilization. The modality is just a kind of a fancy word for exercise or equipment. You know, running is a modality, biking is a modality, lifting weights is a modality. You know, but how you utilize those modalities can dictate whether they're reaching that goal or not. And what I mean by that is, I'll use box jumps as the example. I see coaches a lot of times, they'll use a box jump, maybe in circuit training or something. They'll say, oh, what do you, what do you use the box jump? Oh, we're using these box jumps to get explosive. I say, okay, well, how do you have a program in there? Well, they're going to do a minute of box jumps, then a minute of burpees, then a minute of push-ups. I tell them, wait, okay, well, we took box jumps, which if programmed correctly can be, you know, power, speed, modality, but you turn it into a conditioning modality, okay? Same thing with pull-ups, for example. I use pull-ups all the time with my athletes, primarily as a strength movement. We do that, you know, weighted pull-ups. You know, very low reps, very heavy weight. So we're using the pull-ups for strength. There's other times where I'll do, you know, high rep pull-ups or maybe, you know, 10 pull-ups on the minute, every minute for 10 minutes. Now we're using it, you know, for, yes, we're gaining strength, but it's more for conditioning, for work capacity, for muscle endurance. So you want to think about, okay, 
the modalities that we're using, the exercise that we're using, the type of condition that we're using, how are we utilizing it? Are we utilizing it properly based on what the goal of the training session and what the goal of that actual exercise is? Same thing with running. When you think about running, if we're running sprints to get faster and to get more explosive, we got to make sure those sprints are short with nice recovery between them and then you're doing when the athletes are fresh. If you're running, you know, suicide sprints at the end of practice, not much recovery between them, you know, they're already fatigued from practice, that's fine, but just recognize that now your sprints, your sprint modality has been utilized for conditioning. So you want to start to think a little bit deeper, not just what are the pieces, but how those pieces fit together and how are we utilizing them. So another thing that you want to think about, especially when you're planning um, strength-based workouts, is your exercise placement. You know, going back to the box jump um, example, if we want to use a box jump to get more explosive and to get more powerful, we need to do it, you know, at the beginning of the workout. If you're doing it at the end of the workout, now we're using it, you know, for conditioning. Same thing with, um, and I'll, I'll actually give an example from the other day, someone that, you know, messaged me on Instagram and they said, hey, coach, you know, some, some wrestler somewhere that I don't know, I've never met, and they said, hey, would you take a look at my workout plan I made? And I actually hate when people do this because the first thing I was telling them was, hey, man, like I, I never, I'm never going to take your plan or, you know, your coach's plan, your trainer's plan and look at it and dissect it and break it down. For me. I just don't do that. You know, I focus on what I do and I don't want to, you know, take time or waste your time and look at someone else's plan. But I glanced at it real quick and I noticed, yeah, you know, I had a hard workout. He had all this heavy stuff for legs. And then he said at the end, he said speed work and he had, you know, sprints on the track. And I said, well, this one, the one piece of advice I will give you is that if you want to do sprints on the track for speed work, you need to do that prior to the strength work for your legs. And also just know if you do a lot of speed work first on the track, and now you're trying to do heavy squats and heavy deadlifts, you're not going to be able to really go as heavy. You're going to be in a fatigue state. You're not going to be able to use them as primary strength exercises. It's going to be more for muscle endurance or more just your capacity. So you're going to think about the exercise placement within the program. And just kind of speaking in general terms, you always want to have your power or speed-based training first. Then whatever your kind of your focus exercise is for strength, that will be next. You know, so if you're not doing any speed work that day, then immediately after your warm-up, you know, you have your dynamic warm-up, your activation, stuff like that, your light warm-up first. If you're not doing any speed work, then you would go right to your, what I call the focus exercise. It's kind of in the strength world, they call it the core movement, but you know, when when you, when someone says core movement and you're not in the strength conditioning world, you automatically think core training, right? But when you hear someone say core movement, they might be referring to you know a bench, a squat, a deadlift, or a row. So after our warm up, we have our power and speed based stuff. Then you go to your focus movement or your core movement of the day. So your big compound movement, a deadlift, a squat, a row, a press. After that, you're gonna go to your accessory movements and they should either complement what you just did so if you did a deadlift maybe it's an accessory lat stuff and some hamstring stuff or it may even kind of contrast with that main movement okay and what i mean by that is let's say our main movement is the bench press for the day after that we may do some pulling movements just kind of even things out we may do some face pulls as our as our strength accessories and then after you finish your main strength accessories then you can get into your work capacity stuff. So whether that's muscle endurance stuff or just actual conditioning, that's where I like to do a lot of my kind of strong man style training, you know, carries, sled work, um, you know, tires, sledgehammers, med balls, you know, things like that. So those are kind of the main general considerations. You want to think anytime you're putting together a workout for anyone, but especially when you're thinking about, you know, training your team for group training. What's the goal of the session? What time of day is it? What modalities are we utilizing and how are we utilizing them? And then where are they going to be placed within the workout? Where's the exercise placement? Okay. Now, as far as setting up the workouts, once you have your team, you need to, what I like to do is designate groups. Okay. So if I have, when I would train, the Ohio State team, I would have 20 kids in one hour and 20 kids the next hour, roughly. You know, you have 20 kids at a time. Now, 
if you take 20 athletes, whether they're elite athletes like at Ohio State or whether it's high school kids, and just turn them loose in the weight room and say, this is what we're doing, it's going to be absolute mayhem. You know, guys are going to gravitate towards their social circle. You know, other guys are going to, you know, not want to work out with this guy. You know, people are going to, they're going to be confused about when they're back up on the lift. So what I like to do is I'll take, you know, using those 20 guys at OSU as the example, I break them into groups of four. So we have five groups of four. And within those groups, I kind of try to group them by, you know, size and strength and also maybe weight room experience. But I try to make sure there's always one guy in that group that's a little more experienced than the other three. And it can be kind of I designate as the team captain or the vocal leader uh, within that group. So you've got your four guys. And the reason I like to do this for is because when I do most of my programming, and I'll get to that in a minute, is I try to group things, exercise, including our program, in groups of four. So that way the guys are constantly moving through the program. Even when they're getting rest, they're getting something to active recovery or some type of program. So first thing when you're setting up, designate your groups. Break them in, they know, hey, you guys are in this group, you number them one through four, and the entire season, when they're in the weight room, number one is up first, number two is the spotter, number three is waiting, number four is in the hole. And as they cycle through it, from their main lift to their accessories to the prehab, they keep following in that order, all right? So that's the first thing. The second thing you wanna think about is the flow within the weight room or within your practice room or whatever. So you may have this great idea for like, let's say this circuit or the superset in your head, but maybe it's uh, you know pairing a, a row with some type of conditioning. Like, all right, I'm gonna, after they get off the heavy T-bar row, they're gonna have to do 10 sledgehammers. Well, in my gym, the T-bar row's in the back room and my sledgehammer, my tire is way up in the front room. So logistically, that just doesn't really make sense from a flow standpoint. I need it to be simple so that when they get off the rowing movement, boom, they go right to the, the sledgehammer. So if I was going to use that same example, I would have them do a dumbbell row because we have a dumbbell rack up there. So the athletes could easily go, all right, I'm station one. I do my rows. Now I do my work capacity on the sledgehammer. Then I got a band sitting there next to that so I can do my prehab. You have to think about the flow of the workout, and you may need to make some changes, but you can always make those changes kind of within – the confines of whatever the workout is. You know, don't become so fixated on one exercise of like, well, no, we have to use the T-bar row or we have to use the dumbbell row. Think about what that exercise for filling. We're trying to work upper back. We're trying to work scapular retraction. You can find a substitute that maybe makes more sense logistically and leads to a better flow because the better the flow is, the more efficient the workout is going to be, the less confusion there's going to be, the less you're going to see guys kind of walking around going, Wait, where was I supposed to go? What was I supposed to do? You want it to almost feel intuitive as they work their way around the room. And this is a very, I think, underrated point, or underrated point is that you've got to make sure the flow makes sense. Okay? Now, the last thing, I'm going to kind of get into how I specifically set up training. And I'll kind of talk about how I do it and kind of how it's always been done in the past and Maybe even how I grew up working on it. What I, for lack of a better term, I, I call this, you know, pie programming versus linear programming. All right. Now, linear programming is how I grew up lifting weights. You know, I learned from the, the uh, you know, Arnold's Encyclopedia Bodybuilding. My dad kind of taught me, okay, well, son, today we're going to do chest, shoulders, and triceps. We're going to bench. Then we're going to do, you know, some shoulder exercises. Then we'll go down the line to, you know, maybe triceps. Then we'll do some dips. Then we'll do some abs at the end, and maybe we'll do some stretching. So that's a very linear way to think of your workout. You go from a big exercise to a smaller one to a smaller one to a smaller one to maybe some abs at the end, and then you're done. And I think that's probably how most people think of workouts and set up workouts. Now, the way I started setting my workouts, it was partly because I wanted to be able to get the most out of that time I'm, I'm spending with the Buckeyes. I only have them for you know, an hour and a half per group you know, three times per week or whatever. So I started thinking, you know, if, I, if I'm just telling them, oh, okay, all right, you got to go off to class, the workout's over. Hey, make sure you get your pre op in tomorrow. Hey, make sure at home later, make sure you do some core. I know we didn't get to that. Those things are just not going to get done. So I thought, how can I make this time much more efficient? Make sure we're still getting our main stuff in, but all these other little things that we need to work on, you know, our neck, our mobility, our, uh, you know, our, uh, our shoulder prehab stuff, our glute activation, how do, how do I make sure I sprinkle that stuff in 
and keep all these guys working. That's when I started approaching my programming more as a pie. So think of a pie chart, okay? And when I kind of, you know, start putting the exercise together, I think of the pie chart. I think, all right, we have that focus lift first. That's going to be kind of the most important part of the pie. And then after my guy number, who's designated number one, does, let's, let's say, the deadlift, they're going to rotate then to the next part of the pie chart, which is going to be your key accessory. And the key accessory, if it's a main movement, may be something kind of, kind of antagonistic, uh, antagonistic. So rather than, say, going from a deadlift to, like, a glued ham, which is still work the hamstrings, we're going to maybe go to, you know, a pull-up or a row movement. So it's still working some of the muscles, but it's not going to really prevent us from recovering from that deadlift, okay? Now from that key accessory, we're going to go to maybe – a secondary accessory and that secondary accessory is going to be maybe you know let's say a neck plank or we'll do some type of neck resistance or maybe it's a face pull so we're getting in something we need to get in but the energy and strength requirement is not very taxing on the body so we're still in a way doing active recovery okay now once we've gone to that secondary accessory now we're going to go to either just you know rest as they wait to go back up or some type of prehab that's where i like to throw in you know, band movements, you know, pull aparts, wire raises, face pulls, you know, rotator cuff movements, different things like that. Because now the time it's taken my athlete to do their deadlift, you know, that was you know, very heavy, let's say a max effort, two or three reps. Now it might take them three or four minutes to cycle through that primary accessory, the secondary accessory, the prehab movement. But that has allowed, number one, you know, his glutes, his low back, his lats to feel kind of recover and be ready for that next heavy pull. It's allowed his three teammates or in his little subgroup to kind of filter through, and now they've worked through that pie chart, okay? So that is the way that I set up the majority of my programming. So if someone says, hey, what are we doing today? I say, oh, well, you know, we're going to do split squats, we're going to do weighted chins, we're going to do rows, or we're going to do curls. That sounds like a very basic workout, right? That sounds like a linear program. But – what they don't know, unless they look at it on paper, is within those four exercises, in between each one, within that little pie, we have another two, maybe three stations that are kind of our secondary accessories and our prehab that get sprinkled in there. So there's not a lot of downtime. During that hour, they might only do three or four sets of those four main movements, and those are very spread out. We have enough recovery, so we can still lift very heavy and get strong, but we're still doing lots. My guys aren't standing around for an hour and only doing four exercises. We might be getting, you know, 10 to 15 exercises in. And it's just been a really efficient way for me to do my programming and to make sure that we're getting all that extra stuff in. The guys stay moving. You know, it, obviously you have to think about the flow and set things up properly. But you can take 20 athletes, break them into five groups of four, have your four main movements, have your accessories, have your, your prehab movements, run them through that workout, and you will get – as much as accomplished as you would normally get accomplished with a team in a week, and you can do that in an hour, an hour and a half. So anyway, guys, that's really what I wanted to kind of, um, you know, share with you guys tonight. I don't know if we got any questions here. I'm kind of scroll through these here in a second. Um, all right, my man Park's taking notes. I love it. All right, Coach Forks, if you got any questions about that, let me know. No, that's that's good stuff, Coach. I love how you're – and we got a few people typing questions down here, but um, I love how you break that down into, like you said, that your big movements, your focus movements, and then filtering in those accessory movements below it. Um, also, man, the importance of putting that speed work and power work early in the exercise. But, all right, we're getting some questions coming in. Okay, Adam, you want to know how frequently have athletes lift heavy every week? So in the off-season, my guys are lifting heavy, you know, between three and five days a week, kind of depending on what their needs are. You know, my guys that need to move up or my heavyweights or whatever, they're lifting heavy five days a week. Uh, you know, right now, even, you know, Colin Moore getting ready for the U.S. Open, our, you know, senior nationals, or whatever they're calling it now here in a couple of weeks, he's still lifting heavy three days a week. Uh, but Miles Martin, for example, who is bringing his weight down, he's lifting really heavy once a week. Uh, and then the other day we're doing maybe maybe one or two, maybe one heavy movement, and then we're doing primarily speed work for him, and then his conditioning on those other days. So 
if I think about the high school season or even, you know, with college season, once they really get in the meat of the season, they're still really lifting heavy once a week. And then at second day is either more of conditioning work or more of speed work. Um, okay, so I tend to go with percentage of one rep max. And we generally, you know, usually we're estimating it, of course. Uh, the rate of perceived exertion, I just never really trust that because I, I really, I, I say like my, when I think of rate of perceived exertion, it's what I perceive, you know, so I watch them and I can tell whether they can use, you know, more weight, whether it's too much weight, how much they're actually trying. Cause what I found is when I ask the athletes, they always kind of give, I think maybe the answer they think I want to hear, you know, and not, not so much what I am seeing when I'm watching them. Now, obviously if you're not as experienced with uh, strength conditioning, that may be a little bit tougher. And I think, you know, one rep max is going to be a better way for you to go. And that's honestly how I, I base most of my workouts. Also, too, real, real quick, while we're waiting for any more questions that have to come in, you know, make sure you guys, you know, check me out on Facebook. Facebook. You know, it's Coach Myers Gut Check on Instagram, at Coach Myers underscore Gut Check. Um, if you sign up for my wrestling strength newsletter, which I know wrestling mindset set out in the email, which had the registration for this, I send out, you know, uh, you know, kind of almost like a blog every week, wrestling training tips, stuff like that. I also have ebook plans available for youth wrestling and then everything up through the elite, you know, in season, off season, preseason, tons of other stuff. So no doubt, Jeff, I appreciate you, man. Appreciate you tuning in. No doubt. Okay, Brian is asking three sport athletes. Um, I mean, obviously, I think I always say any any kid that's interested in any sport should play whatever sports they're interested in. I do think obviously there becomes a time where if someone has a lot of you know talent, that maybe they should focus on training for that sport year round. But that doesn't necessarily mean like if I have a kid who's a wrestler and that's his main sport, I don't think he should be have a high volume of on the mat wrestling year round. You know, I look at the off season as this is our development time as an athlete, not just in the weight room, but you know, we go out, we do strongman training, we run hills, we do all this other stuff. And yes, they should be working at getting better as a wrestler. But I think if a kid is competing year round and is on the, you know, on the mat five days a week with their club, you know, year round, I think they're going to get burned out pretty quick. So I think, um, you know, if a kid wants to play three sports, they should. I'm not one of those people that always says, oh, every kid has to be a three-sport athlete. I don't think that's really necessary, but it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, any specific lifts that I think are a must for in-season high school? I mean, if I had to say just your basic, um, you know, staples of my in-season program, we still deadlift. We deadlift heavy year-round. We do some type of pressing movement. A lot of time we move from a bench press to maybe, you know, a single warm dumbbell press or a regular dumbbell press. And we do either a weighted chin or a rowing movement. We do lots of accessory hamstring and glute and low back year round, but especially in season because we make sure we keep that uh, that low back healthy. And the biggest thing is, you know, on our heavy lifts, so once we get in the season, the volume is a little bit lower. We're making sure we're not, you know, we're not trying to build any muscle at that point. So we're gonna make sure that we're, you know, getting stronger or maintaining strength, but not wearing them out. Um, you know, in my in season strength conditioning guy, I break all this down week by week. What you guys are supposed to be doing. Okay, Curtis, man, you got a, about four questions in one there. So I use what, what's called undulating triphasic periodization, which means it's not straight linear. It's kind of a mix of linear periodization. Um, but you also, I put, you know, I do uh, kind of mini blocks where I emphasize different things. We might do a two-week block where we're emphasizing eccentrics, two-week block where we're emphasizing isometrics, two weeks where we do eccentrics, you know, so it, it kind of changes. The exercise might stay the same, but the style, the time under tension for the exercise changes. So I do a lot of things like that. I also do kind of a kind of a hybrid conjugate method where we substitute in different variations. You know, we do a back squat, you know, you know, for about six weeks at the end of the off season, we get into preseason, then we switch to a different type of lunge and we'll do a Zerker squat. You know, so I rotate exercises that way. 
Um, let's see what else you have in here. Best rep scheme for off-season strength versus in-season strength? I would say, I mean, this is completely simplifying it, but in the off-season, you know, we're looking at between three to five reps, you know, for our very heavy compound movements, and during the season, more of a one to three on our main lifts. And it doesn't mean if we're doing ones, it doesn't mean we're just necessarily maxing out. We might only be going up to 85 90%, but maybe we're trying to work on bar speed and pulling it faster. But we keep the reps <coughs> – <laughs> Excuse me. On the heavyweight, a lot lower once we get into season. Thank you, Curtis. I appreciate that, man. I'm glad you guys are utilizing my programs. I love to hear that stuff. All right, guys. We got time for probably one or two more. If anyone got another question, fire away. If not, um, you know we can go ahead and sign it off. Got a couple more guys. Uh, go ahead and typing there. No doubt, Adam. Appreciate you. Appreciate you tuning in tonight. question okay suggestions on leaning out female wrestlers so obviously there's hormonal differences between your know, male and female athletes but you know I, I get this question a lot you know coach will say well how should we change your program for our female wrestlers and i say you shouldn't you know the energy and strength demands in women's wrestling is the same as in in men's wrestling so you know from a strength conditioning standpoint I, I don't think you should really change anything. You know, there's, there's no need to change anything. But as far as, you know, lean, when you're talking leaning out, I would say just with any, the same with any athlete is you need to get them to focus on their nutrition first. And that means not focusing on nutrition, you know, when you're a week or two out from having, needing to make weight, you need to focus on your nutrition year round. The athletes that put on a lot of body fat in the off season are the ones that have, you know, trouble you know, trying to get down to weight in a healthy manner and they have to skip meals or, or whatever. So the advice I give any athlete is to focus on their nutrition. The more they can prioritize their nutrition, then the easier it's going to be for them to lean out. The more energy they're going to have, the, the more calories they're going to be able to keep in their diet as they bring their weight down in a safe and healthy manner. I know that weight cutting is a huge part of the sport and it always will be, but I am not a fan of it. And, you know, my goal is for athletes – to get as strong as possible, to stay lean year round, to eat properly, and be able to, you know, be within walking around, you know, three to four pounds of their of their uh, their wrestling weight, so that that way they can easily make weight in one practice. So Jeff suggests for running in season, long short sprints. How often? What time of day? <laughs> It sounds to me like you need to get my strength conditioning for wrestling in season, guys. Just gonna break it down for you. But if I had to say in general, you want to get your longer runs in the preseason. All right. I have my athletes right now doing one long run a week. You're using on the weekend a four to five mile run, and then I have them doing you know either a, you know really hard one to two mile run. You're gonna really you know kind of tax that mid range stuff early in the week, um, and then once they get once you get more into the season, then you're going to want to start doing, you know, more of your sprint work for conditioning. Whereas now if we're doing sprint work, you know, we did a lot, a lot of sprint work in July and August, but it was more for speed and power development. You know, so we were doing very structured uh, conditioning workouts where your sprint workout you're going to do maybe in January, the rest times are going to be a little bit shorter, more of kind of a, you know, one to one or even a one to one to two where you're sprinting for 10 seconds and then you have 20 seconds of rest. So you're using the sprints more as conditioning there. So, I mean, to answer that question fully, it's a, I could probably do a whole entire podcast or webinar just on when you're supposed to conditioning and what, you know, what type. But the, the big thing is 
when you get late in the season, you want to really try to avoid those long runs. I like that my guys, if they need to, you know, run to make weight, it should be at an easy pace. They should be running at a hard pace for, you know, 30 minutes or whatever. But the, the better thing is to get that weight off on the bike, kind of save their knees, save their legs. I'm a huge proponent of running. I know in the, in the strength conditioning world, there's a lot of coaches that have kind of went away from running. I'm a, a huge believer in running, but I think as you get later and later in the season, the less running you can do, the less mileage you put on your knees, it's kind of better for the longevity of you, you know, kind of in the season. Get those long runs in in the summer and the preseason to really build your base and then taper it down. Yeah, no doubt, Jeff. I appreciate the question, man. Okay, I kind of scanned back and saw, you know, Cliff. So your your follow up was leaning, leaning, leaning on this case, muscle bulk rather than body fat. I would say that you want to focus on when you have your athletes lift, when you have your females lift, make sure they're not doing their movements for a hypertrophy, which is kind of higher reps. You know, so if I'm doing, you know, um, you know, a bench press, you're gonna set to ten, set to twelve, set to fifteen. That's gonna give me a huge pump, and it's gonna blow my pecs up and get my triceps bigger. Make sure they're lifting in that lower rep range for strength as opposed to, you know, kind of a mix of strength and almost what I would call bodybuilding or hypertrophy, all right? Um, someone else said, where can I view your programs? Go to oldschoolgym.com. Click on the tab for um, Shop Now eBooks. You can find them all in there. If you have any questions, and you guys can shoot me a direct message, uh, Dustin at oldschoolgym.com. I answer all my emails. I answer all my DMs on Instagram. If you got a question about our programs, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. All right, cool. Well, we'll get ready to log off here. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for jumping on. A lot of great questions. Coach Myers, thank you for getting on here and supplying us with your knowledge and wisdom. And uh, you guys can see on this page right here, all of his information, his email, website, uh, there. I mean, go there. Um, I visit those websites often, try to gather some information and knowledge myself. So make sure you jump on there. And then you can communicate or connect with uh, Wrestling Mindset. We've got our phone numbers, have our email address, our websites. Uh, you know, we work one on one with athletes, we work with teams as well to do mindset training and then a lot of connections with great people like Coach Myers. Coach, anything to close us out? That's it, man. I appreciate you guys having me on. I appreciate you guys taking your time, you know, away from your family and from your jobs to tune in with us tonight and looking forward to the next one. All right. Thanks, everybody, for getting on, and we will see you all next time.